Excited Utterance, the Evidence and Proof Podcast, Episode 143, Joseph Bloker, Originalism and Historical Fact-Finding. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your host, Ed Chang, from Vanderbilt Law School. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting-edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence. We bring virtual workshops to you throughout the academic year. This week, our guest is Joseph Bloker. Joseph is the Lanty L. Smith 67 Professor of Law and the Senior Associate Dean for Faculty and Research at Duke Law School. He teaches constitutional law, legal history, and property. Our podcast today features Joseph's new article, Originalism and Historical Fact-Finding. It was co-authored with frequent Excited Utterance guest Brandon Garrett and is forthcoming in the Georgetown Law Journal. In it, Joseph focuses on the historical facts used by courts, especially the Supreme Court, that are used for originalist interpretations of the Constitution. Originalism, of course, makes historical arguments, whether they're about historical practices, understandings, and the like. But here's the problem. Who gets to find these historical facts, and how? As Joseph points out, the historical facts used in originalist interpretation are typically found by appellate courts or the Supreme Court itself using arguments from the parties, amicus briefs, and independent judicial research. But that's emphatically not how we normally determine facts. Normally, trial courts find facts using trial processes. The adversarial presentation of evidence, expert testimony, cross-examination, and those kinds of things. Should historical fact-finding look like other kinds of fact-finding? My discussion with Joseph tries to find out. Joseph, delighted to have you on Excited Utterance. Welcome. Thanks so much, Ed. Thanks for having me. So this is a, in many ways, very natural yet interesting collaboration. You, the constitutional law scholar and historian, and Brandon, the evidence scholar. What got both of you started on this project thinking about proof of historical facts? Yeah, I mean, exactly as you set it up, Ed, I come to this as a constitutional law scholar who focuses Really primarily on Second Amendment and First Amendment litigation. And in those areas of law in particular, this question of historical fact-finding has become absolutely central, thanks to some recent Supreme Court decisions. And Brandon, who's just energetic and knows everything about everything, including evidence, including a lot about constitutional law, had suggested, oh, maybe we could actually get together and collaborate on something. We both really enjoy the process of co-authoring. And honestly, it's just been fun since we got started. And as you know, like once you have a fun project going, it's easy to keep writing more. I want to get at this idea of historical facts. So what exactly do you mean by historical facts? And maybe you can give us an example or two of the kinds of facts that you're discussing in the paper and maybe the context in which they appear. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I have to say, it's one that I did not appreciate when I started writing this, just how many labels there are that apply to different categories of legal facts, including historical facts. Like sometimes when people talk about historical facts, they just mean the sort of what in other contexts are called adjudicative facts, like the who, what, where of a particular case, like facts that happened in the past are historical facts. That's not primarily what we're interested in. We're interested in the kinds of historical facts that tend to be central to originalist or other forms of historicist constitutional decision making. So that might be, for example, a fact about, just to pick one from the Second Amendment, were there laws at the time of the founding that restricted gun possession by people who were found to be dangerous, right? That's, a, in some important ways, a factual question. It's a hard one, and it's not like an adjudicative fact in the sense that it is specific to a particular case, 
But originalists have long emphasized that one of the advantages of that approach is that it is rooted in what they say are objective facts. And so Brandon and I were thinking, well, okay, our legal system has rules for how we do fact finding. What if we applied those kinds of rules of fact finding to the kinds of historical facts that originalists are interested in? And that's kind of what set up the puzzle impetus for the paper. Now, you're very careful about setting out this definition of historical facts you brought up adjudicative facts, and just for background for our listeners, there's this classic distinction between adjudicative and legislative facts that Casey Davis proposed almost 100 years ago now. You suggested that these are not regular adjudicative facts. In other words, was the light red or green? You're also saying that these are not quite legislative facts, and I was wondering maybe you can say a little bit more about that. It's really interesting that you go straight to that point, Ed, because I have to say it's the one that we've struggled with most in the paper, and frankly, I think we're still not entirely sure. Like In a lot of ways, the kind of historical facts that we're talking about, including the example I gave there about were there laws disarming groups thought to be dangerous in 1791, are what would by most definitions be called legislative facts. That is, they go above and beyond the four corners of a case. They could inform broadly a variety of case outcomes. In that respect, they are legislative. And that carries with it a variety of implications for how they should be treated in the legal system, including the kind of deference they might get on appeal. I think increasingly, as Brandon and I have sort of honed this paper, we've maybe come around to thinking these probably are legislative facts. We still think, even if they're called legislative, there's still questions about how they should be found initially, like at trial. And at least I think for me, and I I think Brandon agrees on this, it's not satisfying to have a system of constitutional adjudication, which again, originalism, many forms of it at least purport to be, that says, hey, we're relying just on objective facts and yet not find those facts in the way that we find other purportedly objective facts. Like, do we have experts at trial? Do we have adversarial testing? Like that kind of thing. And that's where I think originalism is maybe in the last year or two started to actually run into problems, if you like, at the trial levels. Like lower courts trying to figure out whether we call these adjudicative or legislative, we got to find them in the first place. And that's a practical, hard question. I think your paper focuses on three different aspects of the proof process, or maybe two and a half and this would be the proof process for these legislative facts used in originalist interpretation. The first is who should be finding these facts. The second is standard of review. And the third, and this is why I say it's a half, I think it's related to second, is the role of precedent in all of this. And so with your indulgence, I'd like to take them on one at a time in most of the remainder of this discussion. So the first is the who, that is what institution finds historical facts. And here, I think my question is both descriptive and normative. So currently, who finds the historical facts? And then normatively, who really should be finding these historical facts? So on the descriptive question, one of the things that I find at least striking about originalist adjudication as it is currently practiced in our system, is that almost all historical fact-finding is done by appellate courts and usually the Supreme Court informed by amicus briefing. And I think it makes sense why amicus briefing plays a big role because the kinds of arguments one has to lay out to do a full historical analysis don't fit comfortably just into the page limit of a normal appellate brief. So it's not strange that you would have a lot of different you know, amicus briefs sort of offering facts. What's tricky about it, this is on the descriptive part, what's tricky about it is that is different than how we see fact-finding if it's economic facts, scientific, medical, whatever. Like it, That's different. Those usually are introduced at trial. So I guess even in putting it up that way, I'm starting to shade into the normative side of, the, of your question, which is to say, is that how it should be? Should we have the Supreme Court being the initial fact-finder when it comes to these major originalist decisions, whether it's Bruin in the Second Amendment context, or Dobbs and its conclusions about the regulation or lack thereof of abortion and related practices 200 years ago, is that how it should work? And I think my inclination there is no. 
it's not that trial courts are perfectly situated to be engaged in this kind of deep historical fact finding. It's actually quite difficult. And we lay out a lot of these challenges in the paper. An historian can't really do the kind of expert report that maybe an economist could do, maybe some other public health researcher might be able to do within the 60 or 90 day confines of a PI briefing schedule. It just takes too much time. That's why historians spend seven years working on a dissertation. So that's quite tricky. And yet, if we're thinking comparatively, trial courts versus appellate courts, I think what we're missing, if the Supreme Court does all this fact-finding itself through amicus briefs, we're missing the adversarial testing. We're missing the introduction of expertise at the trial court level. And I think that's a big loss. One of the examples we mentioned in the paper is a district court, I can't remember if it's in Rhode Island or Delaware, considering competing historical claims in a Second Amendment case, said, look, this court's not an historian. I don't have, as a judge, PhD in American history. I can't really engage with the substance of these claims so much. But as a judge, I am well familiar with mediating claims about expertise, whether it's engineers or doctors or economists or whoever. And I can do that, even if it's historians. And I, I think Brandon and I share the sense that there probably is a lot of value in, in stuff like that. So to the normative question, I think an increased role, at least for lower courts, I think would be all to the good. Just to go back to this legislative adjudicative fact distinction, not to over belabor this point, but it seems that as a doctrinal matter, both of you are in some ways suggesting that there shouldn't be this distinction. Because I think traditionally that's what this legislative fact distinction is all about, which is that those are facts that you don't have to actually go and do it at trial like you would have to do for adjudicative facts. It's a, it's a really interesting question, and you might be right about that. And it's certainly something that, as I say, we've been struggling with throughout. And I should say, just to, to shout out a junior scholar here, Haley Proctor has a fascinating paper coming out. I think it's in the Notre Dame Law Review called, I think it's called Against Legislative Facts. I highly commend to all your listeners. Um, and her engagement with that question and with our paper and the kinds of questions that you're asking here, I think really are making me, at least, think about what I think about the distinction in the first place. As I say, I kind of come to this as a constitutional law scholar who's thought about originalism more than I've thought about legislative and adjudicative fact. And so fitting the two together, to be frank, is something I still, I certainly still struggle with. Let me be a little bit of a skeptic on this treatment of historical facts as adjudicative facts for a minute, or to handle them in the trial court. So practically speaking, it seems to me that you're in many ways introducing the same problems that we've struggled with with experts and scientific evidence in other contexts. Trial courts, to me, seem equally non-expert and poorly positioned to make these decisions, even though you were citing other judges or suggesting that, well, you know, they deal with experts all the time, sure, but we're not sure that they deal well with experts all the time. So why go there? Why not think about other ways of dealing with this stuff? Well, two thoughts in response, and I'll admit that none of this feels like a perfect solution. But one is that for me, it just comes down to the comparative question is like, who's better at this? And I'm not sure appellate courts are any better positioned. And here, maybe I'm just, I'm over influenced by people like Ali Larson and Brianne Garode, who've been writing on this for years about the Supreme Court, maybe in particular, but appellate courts generally picking and choosing purported facts from amicus briefing, which feels to me even more unsatisfying, fully recognizing that lower courts face difficulties of their own. The other, I think, and this goes back to my starting point, at least in this, is someone who's interested in the kinds of claims that originalism makes. For me, if, and we set this up a little bit in the paper, is like, if it's impossible to do this kind of fact-finding in the ways that most fact-finding would be done. Like if these historical facts that originalism is pointing to aren't objectively findable by experts or by trial courts, then I think originalists, and some already do, have to cop to the fact that what's at the center of originalism isn't a set of historical facts. It's a set of normative or other claims about the past. And I think that's fine. I mean, I don't think that makes that's fatal for originalism. It's just a, it's sort of forcing a choice, like either this is fact finding or it's not. And so at least making that distinction clear, I think is one of the attempted contributions of the paper. Let me shift gears to your second major focus, which I think is standards of review. And I think it's fair to say that 
you think that there should be more appellate deference to the trial court findings about historical facts. I'm correct on that, right? I think that's right, yes. Okay, so then that flows very directly from this idea of involving trial courts and treating them more like adjudicative facts. And here's the difficulty that I have with that as well. So it seems odd then, though, that individual trial courts, and in fact, this would probably be a single trial judge, would be able to set factual premises for constitutional interpretation across the country. And here, in a way, I think I'm reminded of two analogies, and you can tell me whether you think these are plausible. One has to do with current complaints about nationwide injunctions, which are issued by single district court judges, and people have proposed creating a three-judge panel. You don't want one person making these kinds of calls. The second is, and this is more of an evidentiary complaint, but this is a familiar complaint about General Electric v. Joyner, which basically made Daubert ruling subject to deference. And the problem there is that you can then have two different district courts that come out in opposite directions on the same common fact, which really should be uniformly resolved across your judicial system. So I guess my concern is, if you don't do de novo review on these historical facts, then appellate courts and ultimately the Supreme Court can't harmonize the findings about these historical facts across districts and circuits. Is that a problem that we should be worried about? I think it is, and it's one that we are worried about. I think you're exactly right to point to the nationwide injunctions piece, our comparison, as it were, and of course, lots of fantastic stuff written on that question by Sam Bray and Neil Sahoni and others. That's just a really thorny one and a really hard one. I think it's as equally thorny and hard here. The point you make there just at the very end about considering <laughs> splits of fact as opposed to splits of law across the lower court is a really, really good point. And I think, again, like a central challenge for a mode of constitutional interpretation that purports to be rooted in fact. If a lower court somewhere finds, no, actually abortion was not restricted in 1791, or at least not to the extent that the Dobbs court ended up saying that it was, and you know, lower court somewhere else says something different, like that does set up a really, really thorny problem in courts. I would say too that I think this maps back onto the first thing you were pressing me on about adjudicative and legislative facts, that it is often the case that lower courts, and you suggested this earlier, that lower court finding of legislative fact is not subject to that kind of deference. It doesn't even really need to be found in a lower court. And that is, I think, doctrinally, that's the case. But it's also the case that Kenji Yoshino and other people pointed this out, that the Supreme Court itself has not always been consistent in saying that le legislative fact should be reviewed de novo. And people like Caitlin Borgman have argued that there actually is, there are maybe good reasons for deference to social facts found at trial, which is all to say, like, I don't think we're 100% committed to the position that these kinds of facts should be entitled to some kind of higher level of deference. But I think we see more of an argument in favor of that deference, maybe than most do. Yeah. And let me make clear that it's not that I'm skeptical about this move as a holistic matter. I think actually what you're saying here makes a lot of sense that if you're going to treat these as facts, you should treat them like other facts. I'm just pointing out some of the funny puzzles that I think are things that will eventually have to be worked out. At the risk of self-reference, I was hoping to push you on a thesis that I've been promoting on expert evidence or specialized facts recently. So here's how it would apply to your context. So what if we said that Courts are simply not equipped to find these historical facts in any kind of independent way. And that goes for all courts, right? Trial court, appellate court. And instead, what courts should be doing is trying to seek to defer to whatever the expert consensus is on historical issues. And so in, in a sense, I think here I'm expanding on the quote by Judge Sutton that you include in your paper, where he says he wants to defer to a famous historian with a strong reputation, then I think he singles out Gordon Wood in that case. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting here is not specifically 
deferring to a single expert because that has its problems, but rather deferring to whatever it is that historians generally seem to think. Do you think that would be an acceptable way of handling these historical facts that rather than trying to defer to specific courts, you would be trying to defer to experts in some way, or you would create some mechanism to try to do that? Well, now I think uh, Brandon and I have to write another paper because that sounds fascinating. And actually, I think it's a really good challenge for, for us to think about how what we've been trying to puzzle through intersects with what sounds like something you've thought through much more thoroughly. So my initial inclination would be to say, yes, that makes sense, just as it should make sense for medical facts, economic facts, whatever. There's a certain category of facts, at least, that are subject to that kind of claim of expertise that are kind of settled, if you like, like maybe not necessarily the kinds of facts about which a court can take notice. I'm not an expert on the rules of evidence, but something close to that or trending in that direction. The reason I'm so fascinated about it in the context of this paper and historical facts is I think your argument, as you sort of laid out there, has a lot to do with just a sociology of knowledge, like to whom do we defer for you know expertise on particular kinds of questions. And I think history and historical fact presents that in a really, really interesting and challenging way because people dispute so much what counts as a historical fact and who has standing to make claims of historical facts. It's one of the challenges for our paper, certainly, but it's what you see in fights over the 1619 Project and what goes into K-12 history books is what we see in originalism all the time, who gets to speak for the past. And I don't think of myself as an originalist, although I believe very much in the importance of history and constitutional interpretation, but people who've written on it more thoroughly than I have, people like Reva Siegel, Jack Balkan, who don't, well, except for Jack, self-identify as originalists, but believe very much in history, I think will we'll often say something kind of along the lines of, yeah, history matters very much, but when people make arguments from history, they're not really pointing to facts so much as they're invoking an ethos, they're picking and choosing what matters, what doesn't, and you can't defer to a history department in the way that you might be able to for some other kinds of facts. I've not thought it through enough to know, you know, kind of where I come out on that, but I think it would be a really interesting application of the thesis that you sketched there and not one that we thoroughly engaged with here. In other words, there may be just not that set of historical facts to begin with, which again, if originalists are willing to grasp that nettle, I think changes the claims that they can make in favor of the theory. Yeah. Interesting. Final question for you. What's next for this project? I know you have a related piece with Brandon on fact stripping, which is trying to remove appellate jurisdiction over facts. Are there other ways that you see this project going? Yeah, it's funny. I, I just ran into Brandon this morning, in fact. Uh, he says hi. And we were talking about working on a project. I'll just preview the title, Substance Still Evolving, and actually evolving is the right word, because I think the next project will be something like the Evolving Standards of History, which might actually force us to grasp even more the question that you raised with your penultimate question about what counts as an expert claim about historical fact, what happens when what we know about history changes, when new historical evidence comes to light, when new historical methods come to light that allow us to study history in ways that we haven't before. One of the examples that we address in this paper, it's really big in the Second Amendment context where I spend so much of my time, is the sort of big data approaches to history, the corpus linguistics approach, which has challenges, but also some promise, I think, and was not available to the court when it decided District of Columbia versus Heller, just because technologically it wasn't available. You know, what happens when you can run those numbers, as it were, and maybe learn something more about the past? And that intersects a little bit with the second and a half point that you flagged earlier about historical facts and precedent. So it's funny, Brandon and I started working on these papers as kind of a lark last summer, and now I don't, I can't even see the end of it. I think we've got, we've got a lot more we still need to figure out, so that's a lot more to write. Larks have a way of expanding in the academy, I think. <laughs> they do indeed. <laughs> Well, Joseph, just terrific, thought-provoking paper that interestingly blends constitutional theory with evidence. Thanks for taking the time, and great having you on the show. Thanks so much, Ed. I really enjoyed it. It's probably apparent that I have mixed feelings about how we should prove historical facts in court. On the one hand, I think Joseph is absolutely right to raise the problem, or perhaps I should say the tension between how courts find historical facts that are used in originalism 
and how they find other facts for other contexts. If we're going to be serious about history and not just use it as a rhetorical device or a cloak for hiding normative preferences, then we have to get serious about the proof process for finding historical facts. But it's not at all clear to me that the solution is to treat historical facts like adjudicative facts. And that's because historical facts differ from common adjudicative facts in at least two fundamental ways. First, finding historical facts involves expertise, or at least there exist experts who research and interpret history. That's very different from the usual lay testimony about what happened at the corner of Main Street and First Avenue. Legal actors are not experts, and tasking any legal actor, whether you're talking trial court or appellate court or judge or jury, tasking any of these legal actors with finding expert facts raises a whole variety of problems. Second, historical facts are general facts. That is, they're likely to recur from one litigation to the next. Again, what happened at the corner of Main and First is only of interest once and only to the same parties, and no additional evidence is likely to surface in the future about those facts. So in a case like Main and First, which is an adjudicative fact, having a trial court decide the fact using issue preclusion and having deference to the trial court determination makes sense. But with historical facts, you can expect them to be relevant in multiple cases. And then we have two problems. One, the answer shouldn't change from case to case because that would delegitimize the court system. And two, it's not necessarily the case that we want the first trial court to look at the issue to set the answer in stone for all time. Maybe what should ultimately happen is that appellate courts themselves need to develop more elaborate structures or procedures for finding these kinds of historical facts. That might be the happy medium more process and more development of the factual record than the current use of amicus briefs, but still the uniformity and the coherence that the current practice of relying on appellate courts achieves. In any event, whether you agree with originalism or not, whether you agree with Joseph and Brandon's solution or not, I think you'll agree with me that the issues raised by their paper are certainly worth further thought. Support for Excited Utterance is generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Brandstetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program, as well as the University of Arkansas School of Law. The associate producer is Alex Nunn, and the production editor is Madeline DiPietro. Additional production assistance is provided by Kyra Hammond, and background music is provided by Kirsten Castle Greer, Felix Wong, and Alex Crew. I'm your host, Ed Chang, and I hope you'll join us again next time when we take on another new work in the world of evidence and proof. Mm-hmm.